So yesterday, as you've said, uh, the Commission presented the European Critical Raw Materials Act, and now the Critical Raw Materials Act is on tour, and this is, this is my first gig. Um, <laughs> the reason we're acting is, as we already heard from the previous speakers, because Europe has decided it wants to be uh, getting to climate neutrality by 2050, and th this means a massive transition away from fossil fuels in our economy to cleaner forms of energy, um, cleaner forms of industry, and uh, changing our consumption behavior patterns as well. Now, on top of that, we have a digital strategy and a digital, uh, uh, digital goals. You'll have seen our CHIPS Act uh, a year ago. So we really want to get much more control over the whole digitalization of the economy. And the new element, which has really come up to be equally important with those other two, is defense and aerospace. So this whole supply of metals and minerals for the green, the digital, defense, and aerospace is what's driving us. And we see from this, uh, this could, I could have picked any graph, um, there is an expectation that demand globally and demand in Europe for many of these metals and minerals will rise sharply in the coming decades, and there's going to be a very fierce competition for access to these resources. Right, so the, the purpose of our legislation is to ensure a secure and sustainable supply of critical raw materials for the Union. And it's got four, four building blocks. So strengthening all parts of the value chain, um, external diversification, better risk uh, assessment, risk mitigation through monitoring and similar actions. And then the fourth building block is circularity, resource efficiency, sustainability. We start off, the very first article of the Act is uh, defining that objective of secure and sustainable supply, and then saying, well, how do we measure success? And measuring success is set in terms of, of um, benchmarks, where we're seeking to improve our domestic capability in terms of our consumption. So we should try to uh, extract at least 10% of our consumption needs with domestic, uh, with domestic resources, where we have those resources and where we can get those resources operational within this time frame. The second is um, we should develop and maintain and not lose our processing and refining a capacity in the middle of the value chain. And thirdly, we should develop our capacity to recover and recycle uh, these, these raw materials. The other way we measure success is diversification of supply. What the article, article says on this is we should be trying to source from several countries and not to have more than 65% of our consumption coming from a single country. That's going to be a tough, a tough one to deliver. Now, what we also do, the next provision is defining and limiting the perimeter of action. So there's a broader perimeter of action, which is uh, the criticality exercise, with which you're probably all familiar. Um, and we've updated the assessment and gone from 30 to 34 um, uh, materials on that list. And that is for the whole economy. So what we need is a sharper focus on the things which correspond to our green digital defense uh, priorities. And we've come up with a list of 16 what we call strategic raw materials, where there will be stronger incentives and stronger obligations set out in our legislative proposal. Now, the first pillar is strengthening the value chain. And what you don't see on this slide, I think, is very important because we have put in there provision about exploration. We are asking all member states to develop an exploration program to look at the potential they have in their subsoil for the decades to come. And we're saying, look wide in terms of the type of materials, because who knows what's going to be important decades down the road. Technology requirements change. And look deeper. Um, the next thing we say on strengthening the value chain is let's try and achieve our domestic capability uh, and our diversification goals through identifying strategic projects inside Europe and outside at the different points in the value chain, mining or extraction, refining and recycling. We will have a process to identify these projects. They will have to show that they're helping to meet our headline objectives, that they uh, tick the boxes in terms of environment, social, and governance. They're technically doable. Um, they have cross-border benefits and social benefits in the case of third countries. Um, and also, we'll be looking at the financial bankability of these projects. The consequence for projects in Europe 
of being listed as a strategic project are firstly on the permitting side. We are proposing to streamline the permitting process for mining and for the refining, recycling uh, types of uh, project. The big difference between an industrial facility on the one side and the greenfield mine on the other. We need to have a, a common way of approaching permitting, whether it's for renewable energy, net zero industries, or critical raw material projects. One-stop shop, um, project coordinates to make sure things don't get stuck, um, some deadlines, uh, predictability built into the system, um, also taking a look at encouraging you to make sure that if things get referred by appeal to the courts, there is a prioritization so they don't get stuck in the courts for several years either. Um, and, uh, and also making sure that the environmental impact assessments uh, are done, but you know, more, 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 more effectively. So on the risk monitoring and mitigation, um, we want to bring together the best expertise around Europe. And here we have, for example, Peter from DERA. Um, we have to make sure all these agencies around Europe can work together in the way that gives the best analysis and intelligence possible. So we can look at the risks, we can do stress testing, we can give advisory messages to governments and companies. Um, we will also look into the potential need for strategic stockpiling and information sharing about this. Um, there will also be provisions which would allow uh, governments to um, collectively use public procurement to, to, uh, to secure uh, critical raw materials if necessary. But this is only at the end of a long range of options. The final thing to mention about this is we are asking um, governments to identify which companies over 500 employees are producing the strategic technologies for green digital and defense aerospace purposes. And those companies should do a, um, a regular two yearly audit of their security of supply vulnerabilities, um, risk assessment, risk mitigation, which they should then report to their own company board, not to the government, not to the European Commission. So it's about making companies aware um, and more ready to invest in their own resilience. And governments are free to provide incentives to companies that do the right thing. Then we come to the chapter on uh, circularity and sustainability. We have a list of things we encourage member states to do to promote the recovery uh, and recycling of critical raw materials. We um, put in this regulation uh, an obligation to map the critical raw material potential of extractive waste and to make that data available so that businesses can then make a business case for, uh, for, for recovering uh, that in, uh, critical raw material potential on the surface. We have provisions about identifying which uh, products contain neodymium and other permanent magnets as a prelude to uh, pushing for the recovery and recycling and minimum recycle content of future magnets. Um, we will have the possibility, including in our strategic projects, of recognizing schemes that provide assurance that things are done to high environmental social standards. And we reserve the right to develop an environmental footprint requirement on certain raw materials in a way that allows you to compare the product that exists today, let's say magnesium produced in China with a footprint of 25 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of uh, metal with something that can be done here, which may be done in a much cleaner way, but is more expensive. It's not a, it's not a, a trade restrictive measure. It's information for companies. It's information for the downstream uh, customer. But at this moment, it's just a, a, a shell framework provision, which we'll have to flesh out later. What I should also say, we're going to do a number of things which are not in our legislation, but which we announce in the communication. The first is, uh, we're going to build in cir circularity from product design through the work on eco design on products. We're going to come out with a proposal for the end of life of vehicles, which will prioritize the recovery of critical raw materials. We're going to come out with a, a, a collection scheme for uh, waste electrical and electronic equipment. We're going to add battery wastes like lithium to the list of uh, hazardous wastes annexed to the waste regulation. And we're going to introduce waste rules on the recovery of critical raw materials from wind turbines. So I think you can see we're really taking the circularity um, dimension extremely seriously. Finally, we're proposing to create a European Critical Raw Materials Board, where there'll be a place for every member state, uh, observe a role for the European Parliament, 
and where we'll plug into specialized committees that will bring in the financial world, the business world, and other, other parties that we'll need to help us with all this.